Well, hello. This is the final boss, and this is my edit of The Glade. This is by a uh, streamer, I think he streams, known as uh, Mr. Oldie. I don't know if that's... I, I won't get... I don't want to, just in case, you know. But anyways, off we go to the edit. As a prologue for a book, I'm going in pretty much blind... And I don't think I'm going to be able to go through all of it, but I'm going to go through as many pages as I can after I double space it so I can actually uh, give it a more accurate page count to what I'm... Uh, there we go. Much easier on the eyes, too. Check mark it. Yay! All right. An average-sized man who was in his mid-40s. He had... Okay, so... Usually your first sentence is going to be, really has to be a banger. It has to be one of the strongest sentences in your book because, you know, the, the risk is you may have, you know, other amazing sentences, but the reader will never reach them if the first sentence doesn't at least start to draw them in. So the first thing I notice here is there's a little bit of an uh, odd grammatical structure, right? An average-sized man who was in his 40s, he had a tidy beard in the form of a line, following his jawline from ear to ear. Um, there's like two two questions here. It's like I don't know if we need all this detail. Um, like I don't need to know he was in his forties, all these different things, um at the start off. I mean I know that's like very, very tempting as a writer. Um but you remember you can describe one or two things about somebody and it can imply a lot about them. Um, but, you know, we go on, the beard is connected to a messy and dirty brown medium like Paris, shattered his blue eyes, face covering old dirty from his ventures, he was leading the party, he was wearing, a, he's wearing a snow leopard, whoa. Whoa, and then we change tenses, he is wearing, who was, okay, so there's a tense change here, and probably a little bit earlier, I just wasn't, uh, tense changes from past to present, um, something to ensure to keep an eye on yeah i mean it'll bump the reader pretty hard out of the the uh, immersion uh when when you do do a tent shift there's maybe very very rare cases where you would do that intentionally to like bump the reader but i don't know if this is one of them the beard is connected to a messy brown So, I mean, honestly, I would say, so this could be, like, he is leading the party. You can probably just cut a lot of them. Or maybe you just say, like, the bearded man led. Or maybe you go, like, the bearded warrior. Or is he a warrior? Leads the party. And again, whenever you're breaking up verbs, like is wearing, is doing, um, there's always generally a better verb, right? Is, whenever is is your anchor verb or was, if it's in past tense, there's almost always a better verb out there. Um, mainly because the transitive verb sometimes is the best case, but you can generally find something that's a little bit more lively than a transitive verb, right? So he is wearing a snow leopard coat. Okay. You know, a snow leopard coat drapes over his shoulders. Drapes gives me a little bit more detail. Like, how is he wearing it? It gives me some of the how is he wearing it, right? So, like, consider... Um, consider uh, rearranging sentences to avoid too much reliance on transitive you know is verbs and then it should be like
you know, it could be his this quote further to sort of, you know. You're in present tense. You know, with process for whatever. You can be more detailed, less detailed. That's just random. But yeah, food for thought. A heavy sound, a great sword in its hilt, hanging by the hand, a heavy sound of wet leather boots against decomposing leaves lying there. His name was Thrall. He crouched down and brushed his fingertips through the pink grass, and he felt dust specks on the ground, specks of ash, which he presumed was the ash of a hellhound. He looks back and signals someone to follow. So again, we're kind of in this character's POV. Like I see, I know we're using omniscient, but even when you're using omniscient point of view, um, you know, we'll see. Like, are you gonna like you know? So, deciding point of view, one of the most important things you can do for your story. It, you know, when it's done really well and you have the perfect point of view, it's invisible. When it's done poorly, it, it, it can, you know, break the, the realism of the story. Um, I don't think, you know, I don't think there's too much uh, I would look out for. But just know, hey, am I going for a uh, omniscient point of view where there is a narrator? And a lot of techniques omniscient, pe you know, folks using omniscient narrators do is even having the narrator address themselves as an I. If I'm telling the story, I can jump in anybody's head. You know, somebody is telling the story, right? So you can even make it another character, which is like who's, you know, like that's what kind of Tolkien does in Lord of the Rings, where he says, oh, you know, I found Bilbo's book and I redacted it and I found, you know, Frodo's writings about his journey. And, and, and there is, you know, behind the omniscient uh, point of view in Lord of the Rings, there is a scholar, whether it's Tolkien or somebody in, you know, it's probably someone in Middle Earth in the Middle Earth world who's going through and looking through all these things and sort of saying, hey, you know, this is the extra context. This is how I fit all these pieces together. Um, that is a technique to make an omniscient narrator work. You know, most likely what, what I'm guessing you're leaning towards is, is close third. There are other omniscient narrator ways of approaching it. Like, uh, you know, Virginia Woolf and Miss Dalloway is like the very common example. Um, but, you know, it's hard to pull off. And like for many readers, even her writing and her execution of that omniscient narrator is hard to parse, right? Like, so again, it's like, hey, how easy do you want to make this on the reader? All right, I'm going to keep cranking here. Left hand, he looks back, someone to follow. Um... But yeah, but like this feels like a point of view break. Like this feels like a POV break since it's since, you know, we sense we're in this character's point of view. So why doesn't he name the person following him? You know, like if I'm going on a hike with somebody and I could, I could even tell it in the third person, but it could be a close third person. Right where you know the narrator is is embodying the character that is that they are narrating about. Right, so an example of that would be Jeff went on a hike. He looked back and signaled, you know, Danielle to follow. You know, and, and because Jeff knows who's following him, you can get away with using the proper noun with, with giving us some of that information earlier. So again, we're leading with like a very large amount of description. So again, this is leading into a character with a lot of description. You know, you want to find, if possible, one or two details, you know, like this is a lot of lead in description. Uh, you know, try to find one or two details to start with, you know, um, that will give us a, you know, broad impression, but, you know, zoom in, you know, but if the other info is necessary, you know, uh, trickle it in later. So, yeah, I mean, 
and, and you can also give description with action, right? So we're, we're doing a pretty passive, almost um, like someone reading a character sheet, you know, with, with how, you know, because this is just the narrator. He is followed by an elven woman, blonde, long hair, covered under her hood, green hazel eyes, and a clean face, primetime beauty. She wheels two daggers. It's almost like a, a list, like a, like, a, like a character list. And while I think that that works in a lot of settings, and, and it can be very effective, um, things to think about is, um, well, she is called Anwen, quick on her feet and light as a feather. Okay, so we are really using, um, you know, the, uh, we are really using Omniscient. Like, so this is like narrative, narrative Omniscient. Uh, this is great, but um, remember to, you know, know who that narrator is. Also, uh, I think my chat's working. There, it's working. It's working. I'll post these up on YouTube later. So, and then you can feel free to ask more questions or what have you. Um. So yeah. So all that all that to say, when it comes to the omniscient narrator, I see that you're leaning toward a narrator narrative omniscient, where there is a redactor, there is someone outside of the story rendering these events for the reader collecting whatever like okay i got the scraps from bilbo's book or whatever rather than something like miss dalloway which is kind of this this like very present head jumping um complicated uh, i mean do achievable it's not impossible but it's it's um tricky i mean i would discourage just as a general writing adage i would caution a writer unless you have a really good reason to be an omniscient narrator even if it's a narrative omniscient they are challenging to to achieve and pull off like successfully i mean i think you can get them passable you can make them work but it is really hard to make them kind of level up you know um so you know i would consider you know if you have multiple viewpoints you know have it be close third person with each viewpoint being a chapter or a big page break or something like that that's kind of you know uh, you know, as you're building up those writing muscles, that's a like, you know, starting with an omniscient narrator is like going to the gym on your first day and like benching 400 pounds. You might be able to do it. You know, maybe you're just kind of naturally like, I can bench 400 pounds. But, um, you know, it's for, for the average person on their average journey, it's going to be very difficult to achieve. Klondike Nation, welcome and hello. It is editing time. I haven't done an edit in too long, so I'm very excited. I'm very excited. And this is a great one. This is great so far. Um, but yeah, so the leading description, something to something to think about and to pause, right? So what's like one or two one or two details that will set up you know, eighty percent like you know, it's like the eighty twenty rule. What is twenty percent of this information that will set up eighty percent of the character? Right? Let me put this in here. You know, what's what's the twenty percent of the info here that's doing, you know, eighty, you know, eighty percent of the heavy lifting and lead with that. You know, so we get clean elven woman. You know, so you can like zoom in, right? So like let's say her her name is Anwin. So like for example, this could be like Anwin's, you know, golden hair you know snow dotted you know Edwin's golden hair you know forward and crawled up the mountain whatever she punched You know, she strode lightly atop the snow. You know, and then have some dialogue, and then give some more detail, and have some dialogue, and give some more detail. Remember, so, like, because we're the, you know, I mean, this is just kind of, you know, one of the challenges of writing for a audience that, you know, 
has a lot of things vying for their attention is that hey getting into like the hook and the plot as soon as you can is is generally beneficial right you, and one of the reasons i think this is a pitfall for some writers today is that we read a lot of classic victorian literature where like david copperfield where he like Hey, I'm David Copperfield. I was born. Okay, next thing that happened, I was raised by blah, blah, blah. And he just goes, you know, pages and pages about David Copperfield's upbringing, you know, um, before they get to this story. And, like, for Victorian era literature, that was expected. That was um, achievable. There wasn't, you know, TikTok, like, one grab away. If you need some short reads, I got some to send over. Yes, feel free. Feel free. You know, the, the door is always open. If anybody wants to send uh, send stuff for edits, let me even pull up my bot here. But yeah, I try to I try to do them. I try to do them um, as often as I can. I'm a little sleepy. But I got some fight left in me. All right, anyways, I'm going to keep going. I'm going to go a little faster, see if I can get to some of the meat here. His name is Born. Clumsy as a child in a maze of mirrors. Made made from mirrors. I mean, uh, like again, just some like weird, you know, like some of those like extra um, modifiers and prepositions will make a sentence feel kind of a lot more stuttery when just hey, what's the simplest preposition I can use? Like child in a maze of mirrors. Boom! Instead of a maze made from mirrors, right? Like that's like kind of two nested prepositions. Um, and, it, you know, those types of little economy, and this is like the thing, like, um, those little economies at the sentence level can help you communicate at the meta level much more effectively if, you know, start just building and practicing them. And it's not like big, big things, right? These are little tweaks, but hopefully they can help. Uh, three walking the elderberry grow up in light canopy, throw all the his torch. Let's camp here. Boron has the task of setting up a fancy shield in the ground, a small hole for the shield to stand in, walks in area. So again, one thing that is um, that I think is missing is conflict. You know, as early as possible, um, it's generally best practice to have that goal an obstacle, right? Like there, we we kind of sense that there's a goal. They're walking through some, you know, very snowy landscape, seeming seeming to be going somewhere. But in the scene, so that's like, yeah, I can sense that there's a meta goal. There's a story goal here. But, you know, each scene must have its own goal. What does each character want in each scene? And what is blocking them? And then what happens? What goes wrong if the block is successful or vice versa if they get through? All right, so this seems a bit light of scene conflict uh remember to evaluate each scene's goal stakes and urgency well, i guess stakes are the consequences yeah anyways yeah i'll well, have to forgive me i'm i'm uh, slightly sleep deprived you can thank my toddler <laughs> Found in Pretty Case starts a fire with Triggs during the creation of the campfire, setting up tents. She grabs rolls, slowly begins to plant wood and stakes. So, you know, so again, like we're getting a very detailed description of setting up a tent, but so often because there's nothing surprise, like, you know, like you're not saying like she grabbed a little pill, a red pill, threw it on the snow, and then as it absorbed the, the moisture, a tent sprung to life with flowers and blah 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 right because that's not what we normally think of when you say setting up a tent so you would want to describe that but you probably could just get away with aaron set up the tents or a, a win set up the tents because you're describing a very standard way of setting up a tents which is wooden stakes ropes cloth draping like there's nothing you know because remembering you know what that shorthand is for your reader so if, you know, if I say, you know, m make a cup of tea in America, you know, for a lot of people, that's going to be like boiling water, putting a tea bag in the thing. For other cultures, that can be wildly different. But because I know my 
you know, if I know my audience, or I have a sense of who my audience is, I can ask my wife, for example, hey, uh, can you make me a cup of tea? And she'll put all those steps together. No, I won't want, like, you know, a tea ceremony with, like, you know, certain things in one cheek and all these things. She'll just boil some water and give me some tea, right? So similar thing here where know your audience. Your audience has this layout for um, how to set up a tent. So we might – we don't need a play-by-play play for a familiar action. Only give us – only give us play-by-plays when some, you know, divergence from the average, from the normal, appears and is relevant. I'm even going to put that as a writing tip because I do see this quite a bit. And it's something I have to – it's not like, oh, shame on you. It's like something I struggle with too. Shazam. But yes, feel free to send over short reads. Oh, I forgot. Now that I got the bot up. Edits. There you go. That is the edit place finally we see thrall the leader watching from above while the other two start prepping their tasks climb the tree and cut a vantage point looking for dangers wolf dens bear camps i mean this gives me great D, &D vibes like this feels a lot like a campaign might feel they're all suddenly pulled back into reality as born shots are telling they have set up two minutes in the past the area seems safe enough looking for the fresh venison which meat cause the lady pull a big slab of meat and place it in the fire Boring, nice campfire. You're getting better by the day. I try Thrall. I really do. Pulls their daggers and sharpen them. So usually it's not a bad idea to like set your dialogue apart. I do see that you're breaking up the dialogue. It is possible to do it this way. Uh, I think you kind of do. I think this is a new... Yeah, anyways. Just, yeah. Paragraphy matters, you know, where you break things up, how much white space you leave on the page with paragraphs. It goes a long way to making a read slow or fast. I, you know, like you're pretty, you know, like close to like a lot of the, I think you're doing a lot of the standard conventions, but it's okay to add an extra paragraph just to give some extra white space on the page, which, you know, is my suggestion up there, right? Um... I have some 500 pieces for my creative writing class. But yeah, bring them on, though I think I also have a bit for my whip. Well, feel free to send what you would like, um, you know, edit. I do, like I said, I do do uh, pre-Twitch edits um, when I'm able and when I have a full queue. For many, for weeks, you know, I sometimes will have nothing in the queue. I have a little bit more in the queue. Um, so feel free to share, and I'll be happy to read them. As long as you're good with it being on, on, uh, on uh, stream and YouTube. Boren looked into the sky and the stars. Together he gets lost in the uh, venison. Which is. Captures both of them, which is sizzling happily over the roaring flame. It's a bit of a. Conf I would just recheck the grammar on this sentence. Throw his sharp knife, cuts into three. Brown good coat, hides venison. When the fire is from the adventures and the wood crackling is not as ever, they tuck into their share. It's been a long day. Eventful, to say the least. Though, hasn't been all strangers. We may have lost our horses to that wretched lake, but we made good progress on that bounty. Just wait until we become rich. The 10,000 gold pieces. Think of the ale and horses. We can buy with that. So I, I like this, but honestly, you're giving me a really interesting hint on something magical and intense that happened you know my question is why not start with this lake event you know this lake event sounds interesting why not you know have this be the hook opening conflict you know instead 
of starting at, you know, a slower camping moment. And that's the thing, right? Like, I mean, even in D&D, a lot of players, you know, there there are the social, you know, there, there's, you know, what do you remember out of a and d campaign? It's generally not like, okay, I take a long rest and update my spell slots, you know, like, that happens, but this is kind of the moment we're starting is, hey, we're taking a long rest, we're updating our spell slots, we're kind of recapping what happened, but the moments you remember, at least that for, for me, I remember from my D&D games, is the moments where something went down, something big happened, whether it's a social battle where, you know, we go into a party and steal the information we needed from the king, or a... um or the inverse, right? Like a more direct battle where, you know, that dragon knocked one of our teammates out and we had to, you know, step up and we lost our bag of holding. And, oh, my goodness, you know, that's the stuff that 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 has that kick that keeps someone really engaged. And, and that's something to think about because you have these ideas, right? Like you're saying, hey, we lost that horse this wretched lake. I'm like, how did the lake get their horses? What the heck? Was there a monster in it? You know, um, that's engaging, right? That's really interesting. And I think, um, you know, starting after that, after those kind of conflict events have died down and starting us in a, you know, long rest, essentially, is always going to slow the pace of your story down. Sometimes people can do that intentionally, but you do run the risk of losing some of that initial hook that could keep more readers reading longer, right? It's all about the trade-offs. You know, hey, maybe you say, hey, you know what? I want them to start on camp. I want it to be this quiet, nice moment. Totally reasonable. I would say, hey, is there a way to influ- infuse some sort of social conflict? Maybe the, the party doesn't get along and they're having some little hiccup in their plans to keep me wondering. Um, because if it is just to communicate information, you know, there are generally more effective ways to do that that will create more drama and move the story forward a lot faster. I feel like you're, you know, there's, there's pacing opportunities is all I have to say. I hope that for today, but maybe next time. Currently working on peace. Very cool. Well, you know, looking forward to reading it. And no pressure. I know a lot of folks can stress out. You know, it's a stressful process. That's why I edit my stuff on stream as well. Because I know that the folks who are um, submitting their, their stories to, to get reviewed and looked at, you know, that's not a, that's not a, that's a brave thing to do. Uh, especially for the final boss. Uh, but no, it's very brave. Um... Uh, and that's amazing, right? Like that, you know, no matter what feedback I have, I think that those writers are already setting themselves up for success because even if my advice isn't perfect or whatever, they're at least saying, hey, I'm seeking data on how to get better. And they may say, hey, you know what? The advice Jeff gave me is great. Or say, hey, that's nice data, Jeff, but I disagree. Both are totally valid responses. As the day is falling, quickly the Thor starts to prepare the camp. There's no smoky trekking predators in positions. While Thor is busy with fire, scattered era, repeating the list. And she... Let <laughs> let the enemies let thy enemies down. Let no friends go in. Learn from mistakes. Change. Suspicious part of the comfort. Tethers, they were the frat. Okay, moonlight covers the sky. Creating an aura. Alright, I want to read chapter one. Non crack scaring of birds. The Great War, harsh environment, throws the first wake up, PNG towards the tent. So again, I, I will say like the this prologue might be more for you as the writer than for an initial reader, right? You know, because that's a lot of what professional writers do, right? Is they will write way more. The book will be twice, ten times as long. And then they'll just take the exciting bits, you know, like, and kind of put those all together. And so, you know, like, I don't know if, like, because you usually want something to change, a state to change in the world. When you have a prologue, when you have a chapter, same thing, right? Like, what was the status quo that is no longer the status quo that is something different that that is new you know what 
what oh my gosh happened, right? What is the oh my gosh for this chapter? And I can't look at the prologue and say, oh, you know what? This is really what landed is like, ooh, this is going in a new direction. And I know that's like it sounds like a tall order where you kind of have to each scene has to kind of bounce off. It's like, you know, bouncing a ball um, and it has to bounce harder each time and something new needs to happen. Um, but I don't know if I'm feeling that bounce back of like, oh, new direction. It's go it's it's bouncing off at a new angle. Um, so I would really consider, um, hey, you know, is this a prologue for the reader? Is it more just for your own, you know, which is very valuable to say, oh, you know, what? I'm just writing this down, Jeff, because I'm just trying to put it all together in my head. Uh, I'm a discovery writer. I just need to get it all down. Totally reasonable. Um, but then again, when you come into the edit, you can you can at least ask that question and say, hey, you know what? Was this chapter for me, for me to just to get data about the world, what's going on, who these characters are, how they interact and camp together? Or was, or is this necessary for the final cut? This chapter, uh, this prologue. Um, um, gives good info, I think, to a writer about the camp dynamics. But it doesn't feel like it has the conflict and, you know, change in direction needed for a scene or chapter to make a final cut yeah dawn cracks the sound of yawning birds critters and wolves waking up for the day to begin another day within the glade was so close to a war zone with the great war which occurring this moment between ignore and Emerald, the glade was close to a death zone if you didn't have a guide first to wake up makes his way to the overgrown path long and tedious walk reaches the riverbank unclips his sword bathes I mean, these are very slice of life moments, right? Like he's like cleaning his clothes, he's he's cleaning his weapons, he's you know going in the river, and like even though I'm I am glancing very quickly at this because I I want to do the I got to do the next one. I'm already running a little over. Um, I'm sorry I kind of you know got um you know laser focused on random stuff. Um, but again, like you know, why do we need to know the slice of life? He can see fish calmly in the river. You know what? What is the you know like what is the unique thing? That's that's again so much of what stories are are about humans' desire for novelty, something new, a new experience, a new event, right? And so when, for example, when you describe a tent using very like when you describe each step of setting up a tent, and none of those really you know diverge greatly from what we would expect, you know you'll be missing that novelty hit, and then, you know, my recommendation would be to either shrink it down to say, oh, yeah, she set up a tent. We'll get all the we, we know. Like, you know, if I ask, you know, my wife for a cup of tea, she'll, you know, you know, know what to bring me. Um, you know, like we already can get that extra context um, unless there's something new that like, is transformative that we need to see coming out of it. I hope that's helpful. Overall, I think it's a great story. I love the vibe of the world. I think that it's uh, a challenging uh, decision to have a omniscient narrator. Um, and I would definitely encourage you if you want to stay with that decision um, to read, you know, reread Lord of the Rings, read some books with omniscient narrators. Hey, even read Ms. Dalloway, right? Because there are some, and I wrote a blog post on my uh, finalboss.com about, you know, some of the techniques I thought that Virginia Woolf was using to make omniscient function where in so many other books it falls flat, even though you know, that's still not a fun book to read all the time. It's not, it's not a fun book to read, but she is using some pretty advanced tools there. Um, but it's not like something you're like, ooh, it's, you know, Saturday morning, I'm sitting and eating Cheerios. I'm going to go read Miss Dalloway. You're like, no, I got to sit down, put my reading glasses on, think, actually think about what I'm engaging with. And, you know, we're, we're all fantasy writers. That's, ugh, that's for... That's for those, you know, other folks, right? My my books, at least, are fun popcorn reads. I'm happy with that. Anywho, thank you so much for sending this over. I hope you are well. I hope this is helpful feedback. Please feel free to share um, future revisions, future drafts, or, you know, other stuff you're working on as well. Um, but, yeah, that's, that's a final boss edit. And great job to the writer.
and thank you for sharing. Talk to you soon.